And let me say something that is profoundly painful for someone who grew up as a fan of the Houston Oilers. God bless the Pittsburgh Steelers. Loman, thank you for the terrific job you're doing leading our team here in Pennsylvania. And I want to thank each and every one of you patriots who are standing up today to fight for our country. Thank you. You know, you can tell a lot about a word by looking at its roots. If you look at the roots of the word politics, there are two parts. Poly, meaning many, and ticks, meaning blood-sucking parasites. <laughs> and that is a fairly accurate description of Washington, D.C. But you know, we're here this morning for something a lot more important than politics. We're here this morning because our country's in crisis, because we're bankrupting our kids and grandkids, because our constitutional rights are under assault, and because America has receded from leadership in the world. And I am here this morning with a word of hope and encouragement all across Pennsylvania and all across this country. People are waking up, and help is on the way. This next election is going to come down to three issues, jobs, freedom, and security. Let's start with jobs. I want to take a minute to talk to all the single moms who are here, who are working two and three part-time jobs, who've seen your hours forcibly reduced to 28, 29 hours a week because Obamacare kicks in at 30 hours a week. I want to talk to all the truck drivers, all the plumbers and mechanics, all the steel workers and union members, all the men and women with calluses on your hands, who've seen wages stagnating year after year after year. Cost of living keeps going up, yet somehow your paycheck doesn't seem to keep pace. I want to talk to all the young people who are coming out of school student loans up to their eyeballs, scared. Can I get a job? What's my future hold? And you know, the mainstream media, they try to tell us this is the new normal. This is as good as it gets. Well, as the people of Pennsylvania know, that is an utter lie. You know, it's easy to talk about making America great again. You can even print that on a baseball cap. <laughs> but the real question is, do you understand the principles and values that made America great in the first place? The heart of our economy isn't Washington, D.C. The heart of our economy is small businesses all across the United States of America. And if you want to unleash the economy, you lift the boot off the back of the necks of small businesses. You know, Ronald Reagan and JFK before him both understood that when you cut taxes and lift regulations on small businesses, the result is millions and millions of new high-paying jobs.
I intend to follow the very same path as JFK and Reagan. If I'm elected president, we will repeal every word of Obamacare. We're going to pass common sense health care reform that makes health insurance personal and portable and affordable and keeps government from getting in between us and our doctors. And we're going to pass a simple flat tax. so that every one of us can fill out our taxes on a postcard. And when we do that, we should abolish the IRS. Now, apparently, the IRS is not too popular in Pittsburgh. I got to say, that's a bit of a problem because both Hillary and Donald Trump have come out for higher taxes. You know what? That's how we got in this mess to begin with. We're going to rein in the EPA. And the federal regulators who have descended like locusts on farmers and ranchers and small businesses killing jobs all across this country. <laughs> Pennsylvania is an energy state. You know, being a Texan, I know a little bit about that. And you look back to eight years ago when Barack Obama promised if he was president, he would bankrupt every coal-fired plant in America. It's amazing. That may be the only campaign promise Obama has actually come close to meeting. The war on coal from the Obama administration is wrong. America is the Saudi Arabia of coal, we're the Saudi Arabia of natural gas, and the federal government should not be working trying to destroy the livelihoods of millions of Americans who depend on the energy sector. And energy is key to bringing manufacturing back to America, bringing the steel industry back to America. Low-cost energy means jobs. And we're going to stop amnesty and end sanctuary cities and end welfare for those here illegally. And let me tell you what all that's going to produce. 
We're going to see millions and millions of new high-paying jobs. We're going to see jobs coming back from Mexico, coming back from China. We're going to see manufacturing jobs coming back to Pennsylvania. We're going to see wages rising once again. We're going to see young people coming out of school with two, three, four, five job offers. We'll see mourning in America again. The second thing this election's about is freedom. You know, just a few weeks ago with the passing of Justice Scalia, it underscored the stakes of this election. It is not just one, but two branches of federal government that hang in the balance. If you value religious liberty, the right of each of us to live according to our faith and seek out and worship God Almighty without government getting in the way. If you value the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. <laughs> we are just one justice away from having those fundamental rights stripped from every American. Now, you know, two debates ago, Hugh Hewitt asked all of us about religious liberty and the Supreme Court. And Donald Trump turned to me and he said, Ted, I've known a lot more politicians than you have. Well, in that, he is clearly correct. Donald Trump is a Washington insider who has been supporting liberal Democratic politicians for 40 years. I have no experience with that. And when Donald Trump was writing checks to Jimmy Carter over Ronald Reagan, I was still in grade school. <laughs> but Donald continued. He said, Ted, when it comes to religious liberty, when it comes to the Supreme Court, you got to learn to compromise. He said, you got to learn to cut deals with the Democrats to go along to get along. Well, let me be very, very clear with the men and women of Pennsylvania. I will not compromise away your religious liberty. And I will not compromise away your Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. Now, let me ask you, is anyone here frustrated with politicians who keep lying to us? Politicians who make promises and then they get in office and they betray us. Well, uh, look, Hillary is a great example. And we've seen the pattern. Usually, they talk good on the campaign trail, and then they get in office and betray us. Well, I have to give Donald credit. 
He's betraying us before he got elected. <laughs> Two days ago, Donald Trump went on the Today Show, and he agreed with Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama that grown men should be allowed to use the little girl's restroom. Now that's just nuts. Listen, this is not a matter of Republican or Democrat or conservative or liberal. It's a matter of basic common sense. As the father of two young girls, I can tell you it doesn't make any sense at all to allow adult grown men, strangers, to be alone in a bathroom with little girls. And that's just political correctness on steroids. Now, a couple of months ago, Donald told us he could be the most politically correct person on earth. Well, haven't we had enough of this nonsense? How about common sense and telling the truth? <laughs> the third critical issue in this election is security. For seven years, we've seen an administration that abandons our friends and allies and that shows weakness and appeasement to our enemies. You know, again, two debates ago, Donald Trump explained to all of us that if he were president, he would be neutral between Israel and the Palestinians. Well, let me be very clear. As president, I will not be neutral. America will stand unapologetically with the nation of Israel. And you know, anyone who can't tell the difference between our friends and our enemies, anyone who can't tell the difference between Israel and Islamic terrorists who want to kill us, that raises real questions about their fitness and judgment to be commander in chief. Over the last seven years, We've seen our military weakened. We've seen readiness undermined. We've seen morale of our troops plummeting. And you know, as a nation, we've seen this before. We've seen another left-wing Democratic president, Jimmy Carter, weaken and undermine the military. And then in January 1981, Ronald Reagan came into office. And what did Reagan do? Reagan cut taxes. He lifted regulations. The economy took off millions and millions of new jobs. That generated trillions in new government revenue. And he used that revenue to rebuild our military. And we bankrupted the Soviet Union and won the Cold War. I intend to do the exact same thing with radical Islamic terrorism. We're going to repeal Obamacare, pass a flat tax, rein in the regulators, stop 
amnesty. That's going to create millions and millions of new jobs, bring manufacturing jobs back to America, raise wages. That'll generate trillions in new government revenue, and we will use that revenue to rebuild our military so it remains the mightiest fighting force on the face of the planet. To ISIS and Al-Qaeda and al-Nusra, to every jihadist on the face of the earth who has declared war on the United States of America, who intends to murder innocent Americans, a day of reckoning is coming. We are coming to get you, and we are not coming to negotiate. We are not coming to compromise. We're not coming to cut a deal to arrest you or read you your rights. We are coming to kill you. You know, one of the saddest things we've seen over the last seven years has been this president sending our fighting men and women into combat with rules of engagement so strict that their arms are tied behind their back that they cannot fight, they cannot win, they cannot defeat the enemy. That is wrong. It is immoral. And mark my words, in January 2017, it will end. to every soldier and sailor and airman and marine. And for that matter, to every police officer and firefighter and first responder. The era of a president who mocks and ridicules your service is coming to an end. And you will once again have the thanks of a grateful nation and a commander-in-chief who's got your back. So let's talk a little politics. <laughs> you know, this past year has been an interesting year. Hadn't been boring. <laughs> we started last year with 17 Republican candidates, an amazingly talented, diverse, young, dynamic field. What a contrast with the Democrats. You know, the Democratic field consists of a wild-eyed socialist with ideas that are dangerous for America and the world, and Bernie Sanders. And over the course of the last year, the primary did its job. It narrowed the field. As we stand here today, there are two and only two people who have any plausible path to winning the Republican nomination, me and Donald Trump. And let me tell you what we're seeing happening all across the country. Republicans are coming together and uniting 
behind this campaign. Nationwide, 65 to 70 percent of Republicans recognize that Donald Trump is not the best candidate to go head to head with Hillary Clinton. That Donald Trump loses to Hillary Clinton and he loses by double digits. If I'm the nominee, we beat Hillary Clinton. You know, just a few weeks ago, there was a general election poll in Utah showed Hillary Clinton beating Donald Trump in Utah. <laughs> now, Utah may well be the brightest red state in the entire union if the Republican candidate can't carry Utah. We are headed to a Walter Mondale-level bloodbath. In contrast, Head-to-head head between me and Hillary Clinton, we are beating Hillary Clinton in key swing states. In the state of Ohio, Donald loses to Hillary Clinton. We beat Hillary Clinton. In the state of Iowa, Donald loses to Hillary Clinton. We beat Hillary Clinton. In the state of Wisconsin, which hasn't gone Republican in a presidential race since 1984, Donald loses to Hillary Clinton by 10 points. Hillary and I are tied at 44-44. And here in Pennsylvania, another classic battleground, Donald loses to Hillary Clinton. Hillary and I are tied in the state of Pennsylvania. And let me tell you right now, we're coming back here in October and November, and if we stand together, we are beating Hillary Clinton in Pennsylvania. Now, you may have heard a couple of days ago, the state of New York voted. And the media reported with breathless excitement that Donald had won his home state. It was very exciting. And Donald and the media immediately said, New York City has spoken, the race is decided. You know, it's interesting. I think Donald and the media believe Pennsylvania is a suburb of Manhattan. <laughs> I've got a whole lot more faith in the men and women of Pennsylvania. The eyes of the entire country are on Pennsylvania right now. Pennsylvania has a platform, has a megaphone to speak to the country. And we face a choice. Do we want to nominate a candidate who's a phony? Who is telling us he's lying to us? Or do we want to get behind a strong, positive, optimistic, forward-looking, conservative campaign? with real solutions to the economic problems in this country. You know, if you've got a car that's broke down in the driveway, do you want your neighbor to come over and start yelling and screaming and cursing at the car? Or do you actually want someone to lift the hood and fix the engine? And
And we don't want to nominate a candidate who hands the general election to Hillary Clinton as a Christmas gift. Donald Trump may be the only person on the face of the planet that Hillary can beat. So I want to say to each of you on Tuesday, Tuesday is going to be a pivotal day. I want to ask every one of you to come out and vote for me 10 times. <laughs> now look, we're not Democrats. <laughs> I'm not suggesting voter fraud. But you know, if everyone here picks up the phone and calls nine other people and gets nine other people to come out and vote on Tuesday, you will have voted 10 times. That's how we win, from the grassroots, from the people. If we stand together and unite, you know, it's amazing the unity we're seeing in the Republican Party. We started with 17 Republican candidates. Of those, five have endorsed this campaign. We have earned the support of Rick Perry and Lindsey Graham and Jeb Bush and Scott Walker and Carly Fiorina. When you add to that mix Mike Lee and Glenn Beck and Mark Levin, We've got the entire spectrum of the Republican Party all coming together, united behind this campaign. And if we stand united as one, we will win the Republican nomination. And if we stand united as one, we will win the general election and beat Hillary Clinton and turn this country around. You know, it took Jimmy Carter to give us Ronald Reagan. And I am convinced the most long-lasting legacy of Barack Obama is going to be a new generation of leaders in the Republican Party who stand and fight for liberty, who stand and fight for the Constitution, and who stand and fight for the Judeo-Christian values that built this great nation. Thank you, and God bless you. That was Ted.